And you would think, do they have a bacterial infection and look for that? Or are they under stress? Because you can tell whether they have herbs or not. <laughs> yeah. And then what decreases them in terms of radiation exposure, B12 deficiency? So I did that for each of the white blood cells. Uh, and so I'm just going to leave you to work on those. Because they're, they're laid out exactly the same all the way through. Okay? So one thing that we do is we, and when we look at this line of development that we talked about last time, which is going from pluripotent stem cells to myeloid stem cells or lymphoid stem cells, is because we have these stem cells, and the one thing I didn't talk about that I, I needed to remind you is that stem cells undergo mitosis and give rise to new stem cells. So when you have stem cells that you need all your life, those stem cells didn't develop in, in, when you were an embryo and hanging around for the rest of your life. You're constantly remaking re, re them through mitosis, right? So because we produce an enormous amount of red blood cells per minute and white blood cells per minute, then pluripotent stem cells are highly mitotic cells, constantly giving rise to new pluripotent stem cells all the time. So anytime you have a tissue that is very active mitotically, you have the capacity for mistakes to occur that lead to cancers. <laughs> and then you also have the chance for exposures that can alter gene expression and lead to cancers. And so what we see then is, is uh, a form of cancer that we call leukemia, all right? And then there's a number of different types of leukemia, and the different types of leukemia occur depending upon at what stage the cancer is occurring, okay? So there's a couple of acute leukemias where the cancer occurs in the myeloid stem cell, and so instead of having mature red blood cells, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, what, what happens is the myeloid stem cell rapidly undergoes uh, division and gives rise to all these blasts. So we have a, a pro-urethroblast, pro-megakaryoblast, monoblast, myeloblast, and then they will elevate in the blood. So that you get this enormous shift in cells in the blood from mature cells to immature cells. And then, not surprisingly, immature cells don't do the correct work of a mature cell. And so that leads to what, what we collectively put together as leukemias, which are blood cancers. So some of the acute myeloid uh, uh, cancers uh, are, are very rapid onset and uh, if not aggressively managed, uh, somebody's life is less than a year and a half once they have been diagnosed with, with some of the acute leukemia. So it's a very rapid progression. And what happens is it converts you from having a functioning immune system and functioning red blood cells to carrying oxygen to having all these immature cells that don't do the work. And so, so people become very susceptible to, to uh, anemians and things like that. So, just kind of an overview looking at that. So leukemia is, as I said, a cancer of the tissues that form uh, blood cells, white blood cells and red blood cells. And generally, uh, in a cross-range view of leukemias, what we would see is, is a fever. Uh, the patient would have a fever. They would have swollen lymph nodes, which would be one of the key. Which is why when you go to the doctor, they're always feeling your neck and your your armpit, your groin, and other areas for lymph nodes. Sometimes joint pain is in, involved in it. Sometimes the spleen, which is one of your immune uh, system organs that produces red blood, white blood cells, along with lymph nodes, will be swollen. Sometimes uh, there's a change in bruising that occurs from trauma, and internal hemorrhaging are all kind of go with, with uh, the general leukemia. And so what we can do is we, we kind of divide leukemias into broader groups. 
So the way I was just talking about the very quick onset ones are the myeliogenous leukemias, and that's because they're arising from that myeloid stem cell, the, the second cell that was in that sequence. And then uh, they, they, are, they, they can be very acute. Uh, usually these types of leukemia are much more common in people over 65, less common in people under 65. That doesn't mean they don't occur in people under 65. Uh, the acute uh, forms can be very rapid and have very poor diagnosis, as I indicated. Without treatment, uh, you could, uh, your life expectancy is, is only about a year uh, once the, the leukemia occurs. So what they do with treatment is they use chemotherapy that destroys all those myeloid stem cells. So they use intensive chemotherapy that destroys all your own stem cells. And then once they've destroyed all your stem cells, then you have to get stem cell transplants. And then that's how they manage it. And then once that happens and, and the, the transplant is good, then your prognosis is much better. So just kind of better. So the most, the most widely known uh, type of, of uh, leukemia are lymphomas. And then the most common lymphoma is, is Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's one of the oldest cancers that we actually uh, were able to describe and actually find treatments for. So uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma was identified in 1832, so it's a, it's a really old cancer relative to a lot of the cancers we, we, we deal with. And it's one that uh, is reasonably curable with chemotherapy because of the long history of, of understanding it and try to, to manage it, so it's kind of interesting. Then we have a whole group that we call non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Uh, and so uh, one example of that would be infectious mononucleosis, which people get, which is actually from a virus called the Epstein-Barr virus. The Epstein-Barr virus is a virus that belongs to the group of viruses that are herpes viruses that we think of that give cold sores and, and give rise to, to uh, genital herpes as well. And so it's a, herpes, it's a herpes virus that follows the pattern of all herpes viruses like chicken pox. Because once you've been exposed to the virus, it hides in your nervous system and you never get rid of it. So, so if, you, if you had infectious mononucleosis, you will show positive for Epstein-Barr viruses usually the rest of your life. We can actually test for them. So that's kind of a non malignant uh, disorder of, of uh, leukocytes. And then uh, the other ones are vary from aggressive to intermediate forms. And the, the key to most lymphomas is the earliest they cough, the best the prognosis is you really have. So, so something from a clinical standpoint. They're really, there are 28 different types of lymphomas. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail with that. But uh, and oh, the other thing, the interesting thing is there, there seems to be maybe a familial uh, side to some of the lymphomas which suggests there's a genetic component. And then there's been some very closely associated exposures, benzene being one of them. And benzene used to be commonly used in industrial solvents and stuff. And it was uh, removed 20 years ago because of the connection to lymphomas. But there's a form of benzene that's in cigarette smoke. And so there's also a fairly strong correlation to cigarette smoke and, and uh, leukemias as well. So kind of because of the, the pyrohexene that's in cigarette smoke. So the other thing we have besides our white blood cells and, and red blood cells are platelets. So platelets develop from those megakaryocytes that break up. And then platelets help us clot. And so they're tiny little uh, subunits of cells. And while the megakaryocyte is developing, they, may, they manufacture granules. Uh, and then when the cell fragments, the fragments contain these granules. And so we have two types of granules. So 
what we're really saying is that we use smooth ER or rough ER to manufacture some stuff. Golgi apparatus packages it. And then instead of the package being exported out of the cell, it's retained in the cell. Uh, and, then, and then when the cell fragments, then these little packages are in the fragments. So we have alpha granules and dense granules. And the key to platelets and clotting is that many of the things that we need to accomplish clotting of the blood are housed in these granules. And so the reason why we house them in the granules and don't export them from the cell is because when they become free, they clot blood. And so you don't want these clotting factors free in your blood because then you clot blood all over your body, which would never be a good idea. So what you want is for a process to occur where you get vascular damage. The vascular damage then attracts platelets and then the platelets become activated and liberate the things inside of them to help you clot. So there's a, a, there's a pattern to, to the way it works to prevent you from intervascularly clotting uh, blood all the time. So what, we, what alpha platelets contain are clotting factors and then a, a hormone that stimulates epithelial uh, mitosis and growth. And so it's called platelet-derived growth factor. And so it's really kind of cool because the inside of all of your cardiovascular system is lined with simple squamous epithelium. And so if you damage a blood vessel where it's been cut, then you've got an opening in that, in that simple squamous epithelium. And what platelet-derived growth factor does is trigger the squamous cells to undergo mitosis and repair the damage to the lining. So it's kind of cool that you damage the lining, platelets are attracted to it, and then the platelets release a compound to help you repair your tissue at, at that point again. Because you don't want a growth factor just circulating, making growth all over your body. Either. You want to target where the growth is occurring as well. And then dense granules contain ADP and ATP. Obviously ATP because it's an energy source, but ADP is sticky. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use ADP as a glue to, to connect platelets together into a plug. So it's really kind of cool. And then calcium is going to be required for the process. So even though we carry some calcium in our blood, at a point where we need to clot blood, we need a higher calcium load than would normally be found in the blood. So the platelets deliver the calcium to the area where damage occurred as well. And then a couple of other uh, hormones that help us with repair of serotonin and fibrin stabilizing factor. All right. So what happens is that we make platelets and we try to maintain between 150 and, and 400,000 platelets per microliter of blood. Some people produce a lot more platelets than that. So if you get an increase in platelets, then what, what, you, would, what you would have is, is thrombocytosis is, is what the, the diagnosis would be if you have a real high, high elevated platelet. And again, it, it occurs because of the myeloid uh, stem cells that we just looked at in the Elevation of myeloid stem cells. So, the whole process that occurs when you damage a blood vessel sets up first the activation of platelets that deliver the things that we need to make a clot, and then instituting a clotting process. So it's kind of a two-step process. So the first step is to attract platelets to the damaged area, and then activate those platelets so that they will begin to release the things you need to develop a clot. So the first stage is kind of a platelet blood formation. And so what happens is if you damage the blood vessel, then uh, the basement membrane and all epithelium sets on, besides the basement membrane, what kind of tissue? What kind of connecting tissue? Areolar tissue. So all epithelium has a layer of areolar tissue associated with it. Areolar tissue has collagen fibers. So when you damage a vessel wall, you actually get free collagen fibers that are extending from the damage. And when platelets come in contact with free collagen fibers, 
they set up this platelet aggregation process. So connecting the dots to that with coronary artery disease is when your coronary arteries become inflamed and the endothelial lining becomes damaged, then you have free collagen fibers that then begin to aggregate platelets in the area and can occlude coronary arteries. So that's one of the right, that's one of the strongest connections with cigarette smoking and heart attacks is that the compounds in cigarette smoke irritate the endothelial lining with arteries. And once they become irritated, you can get destruction of the squamous cells and behind the squamous cells you have areola with nectar tissue. And then once you have free collagen fibers, then you're going to cause this, this to automatically occur in, in your blood itself. So, so what happens is the platelets uh, begin to stick to these free collagen fibers and they become activated. So in lab, there are two models of platelets, one without wires and one with wires. So the one without wires is an unactivated platelet, and the one with wires is an activated platelet. So what they're trying to show you with the wires is that once you activate a platelet, it changes its shape and it gets these projections on it. And then the projections will attach other platelets to it and activate them. So what we do is we start with one platelet that gets activated, and then it begins to activate a whole bunch of platelets afterwards. So that we end up with all these activated platelets. So as new platelets arrive and get come in contact with these projections, they become activated. And then they liberate the ADP because the ADP is going to be the glue that sticks them together. And so what we end up with is this platelet release reaction where they liberate all their granules as they become activated. And then that's going to allow us to create uh, what eventually is going to be a clot. All right, so we have to activate platelets to, to do that. So there's another compound that's in the, the, back, in the little granules in platelets, and it's called thromboxane 2A. And so the, the cool thing about thromboxane 2A is its, its production is impacted by aspirin. So what we've learned is that we can use aspirin to change the clotting properties in blood so that as we age and we tend to have more clotting problems inside blood vessels like coronary arteries, we can put somebody on a baby aspirin a day and on a baby aspirin it prevents the formation of thromboxin 2A which prevents this reaction from occurring so that you don't get occluded coronary arteries as well. There's, there's been a long history of data now linking the advantage of a baby aspirin per day, usually taken in the evening, because at night is when most heart attacks occur. And they occur at night because you're sleeping, your heart rate drops, and as blood flow slows down, this clotting response, this platelet response is activated or, or elevated or increased. So that's why we're always concerned post-operatively about patients developing blood clots. Is because while they were under anesthesia, their heart rate was down, their blood flow was way down. And anytime blood cools, it wants to begin to clot intervascularly. So you can use baby aspirins to prevent that. A very cheap way of preventing heart attacks. So the recommendation is that postmenopausal women and men in their late 40s, early 50s just start taking a baby aspirin every night before you go to bed. And it really decreases the incidence of, of those nighttime heart attacks. So what happens because we're going to, uh, and then thromboxin uh, activates other platelets. So the thromboxin is what is uh, in these projected platelets that help activate the platelets that come in contact with it. So the only bad news is, is if you're on baby aspirin and you cut yourself, then you don't, you don't clot. You tend to bleed a lot. So what I should do, before we do the blood lab, two weeks, I should tell everybody to start taking baby aspirin two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody would have had to pick, prick more than one finger yesterday to get blood. So is it really effective then when they say people are having chest pain to give them the aspirin and kind of help with the pain? Yeah. 
And actually for two reasons. Less this, because this is, this is a time thing, but, but uh, one of the things that we know is that the pain uh, associated with a heart attack elicits a sympathetic response, which then drives the heart to have more problems. And so, so anytime you can deaden the pain, you can you have a longer time to manage the consequences of the pain. Right. 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 We have an aspirin's the quickest quickest release. The, the way it works as an anti-prostaglandin. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to create what we call a platelet flow, and that's the initial stop for bleeding. So that's the initial thing that's going to to prevent bleeding. So once we've got our plug then what we need to do is to create a cascade reaction that's going to convert the plug to a scab. So on yourself, you, you could recognize this, maybe you cut yourself and you're holding pressure on it and you stop bleeding. If you're the inquisitive scientist like me, it's like, oh, I stopped bleeding. You rub it and it bleeds again. And that's because it was a plate of plug and not a scab. So the plug is like the, the the chewing gum <laughs> that's just plugging the hole and then you need to change that. So what happens is that we have to initiate a clotting process. So I want to go through this fairly quickly again because I've laid it out pretty well for you. Uh, so what happens is there's two ways we can initiate the process. One is extrinsic, meaning there's actually physical trauma, external trauma to tissue. And one is intrinsic, meaning there's internal trauma to tissues, but maybe not external trauma to tissues. So they could be independent or they could be working together. And then both pathways, the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway, all lead to the, the same place, which is the common pathway. So this one leads to the common pathway by itself. This one leads to the common pathway by itself. These two collectively both lead to the common pathway. So now, no matter how this process is initiated, the end product is the common um, pathway. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the common pathway in detail and worry less about the, the steps of the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. And then if you have to know plotting in real detail, because you're going to work for, for the Red Cross and the Blood Center or something, then they teach hematology classes and go through it in extreme detail. So, so I don't have to. But the key I want you to know is that all we're going to do is we have factors that are all numbered and they're carried in the granules. And because we don't want clotting to occur when we don't need it, the factors are all maintained in an inactive form. And when we need to clot them, we have to activate the factor. And that way we can control where clotting is going. So notice that this says activated factor 12. That means we have an inactivated factor 12, right? So the same pattern down here is we've got activated factor 10. So the end step for both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway is that we activate a factor called factor 10. And it's activated factor 10 that initiates the common pathway. So we need to activate factor 10 to initiate our common pathway. And so factor 10 is an enzyme called thrombokinase. And what the enzyme is going to do is it's going to take factor 5 and activate factor 5. Right? So Factor 5 is a compound called proaccelerin. And what thrombokinase does is convert proaccelerin and activates proaccelerin to an, an active enzyme called pro, prothrombinase. So what we need to do to initiate the common pathway is to have an enzyme that's going to start the pathway. And that enzyme is, is prothrombinase. And what we need to do is activate an enzyme that's going to create this enzyme. So it's an enzymatic pathway uh, of activation. All right. 
So then what happens is that, uh, and I'm going to go through this and then we'll come back to this. So what happens then is that we have an inactive form of a compound called prothrombin. Then its active form is called thrombin. So it's the same thing we did with enzymes where you put an O-G-E-N on the ending of it or you put a pro in front of it. So inactive form, active form. And so what prothrombinase does is it activates thrombin, from prothrombin. And then what thrombin is going to do is activate a protein that is free in your blood, that is circulating in your blood. So I, I just want to go back to one slide to reinforce that for you. Uh, and so if we go back to this slide, notice that one of the proteins in the blood is this protein called fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is made by the liver, just like our other one we talked about in the last unit, angiostensinogen. Those are both proteins made by the liver, and they're, they're in your blood. They're, they circulate in your blood. But we want them in an inactive form because they don't do anything if they're in an inactive form. But if we need to use the protein, then we have to activate it. So what the common pathway does is it activates a, a uh, it activates this protein that we circulate in our blood called fibrinogen. And when you activate fibrinogen, it converts it to what we call loose fibrin threads. And the loose fibrin threads are like glue that stick platelets and red blood cells together to convert the platelet plug to a blood clot. All right. What, what activates fibrinogen? Thrum. Okay. So just follow the arrows. And we, and we require calcium to do this, which is why calcium was in those granules. So the whole process is just activating one compound that activates another compound that activates another compound. So it's just a sequence of activation reaction. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take thrombin and we're going to convert fibrinogen to loose fibrin threads that begin to adhere red blood cells and platelets together. But this is still unstable. So what we have to do is we have to activate a factor called uh, 13, factor 13, which is going to convert the loose fibrin threads to stabilized fibrin threads. And then at that point, we have a blood clot. So it's a sequence of events that, that occur to it. So one of the things we have genetically, if you think about it, is all of these are proteins. Proteins are coded by genes on DNA, right? So if you change the DNA sequence, then you change the protein. And oftentimes when the protein is changed, it doesn't work. So what we have is several gene mutations to these proteins that help us clot blood, and then they prohibit the reaction from occurring so that we can't clot blood. So they're all referred to as hemophilia. And instead of just one type of hemophilia, we have a number of types of hemophilia, depending on which of the proteins actually has the gene mutation for it. Okay. So for example, to do the intrinsic pathway, we actually have to have factor 12 that gets activated to activate factor 10. Well, there are people with a gene mutation for factor 12. And so people with a gene mutation for factor 12 actually have what we call hemophilia B, because they cannot activate that pathway. Meaning that since they can't activate the common pathway, they cannot clot blood. So that's the whole kind of cool thing about, about hemophilia is that kind of pathway. All right. So I talked about all this, but the, the name for factor 13 is fibrin stabilizing factor which is cool because it tells you exactly what it's going to do. It's going to stabilize fiber. Yeah. So, 
So what I want you to know is the common pathway. And then within the common pathway, I want you to know the number and then the real name. So in all of them, I gave you the name and the number in, in, the, in the field. Okay. So the most common hemophilia is hemophilia A. Uh, and it accounts for about 85% of the hemophilic cases. It's actually a gene mutation on the X chromosome. So because it's a gene mutation on the X chromosome, it affects males much more significantly than females in, in a population. It's just a matter of, of, of understanding the genetics. So what you actually have then is, is this is a defect for factor eight, all right, which is a factor in this sequence. And so you can have you can have a normal gene for eight, or you can have this mutated gene for eight. So we we'll do a little eight for it. So this is a mutated gene. So a woman could be a carrier because she has a normal gene and a abnormal gene, because this is on the X chromosome. So a woman can be a carrier and never demonstrate the disease. But a woman who's a carrier donates a X chromosome to the son. So 50% of her sons could be hemophiliacs because it's a random occurrence on which of the X chromosomes is donated to the son. So that's why males are much more common than females for this type of hemophilia. To actually get a female, then you have to have a male who's actually a hemophiliac. And the mother has to be a, at least a carrier. So the, the woman would end up with two genes for the hemophilia. Or a man just has one X chromosome, so whatever gene they get on the X chromosome is what's expressed. So it's, it's much rarer probably more common in today's world than any time before, because before we learned to take drugs to manage hemophilia, then there was little chance that maybe that little boy survived to breach uh, sexual maturity without cutting themselves significantly, as boys go out and do all kinds of things that are detrimental to their body throughout their early years. And a woman who is a hemophilia would die after her first period, if she managed to make it through her first period without cutting herself. Because as soon as she started her period, she would never be able to talk and turn the period on. Yeah. So, so what's fascinating about that is it's the fact that women are carriers that have kept the gene in the population. Just like, just like sickle cell, it was the carriers that kept the gene in the population. So it's kind of interesting to see that. So it's a gene mutation on the X chromosome. It occurs in about 1 in 10,000 births. So it's reasonably common uh, in, in, in those populations. And then what happened in Europe was it was a real class society where there were the nobles and then the people that did all the work. And the nobles, maybe behind the barn, played around with the people that did all the work, but never in the castles. And so they used to marry their own cousins. And in, in, the, in the weirdest one was one of the Roman emperors, one of the Caesars, actually married his mother. and had kids. So anytime you're doing that stuff, where you're prop, where you're, uh, anytime you do that, these, these genes get, get amplified in that population. So what we saw is a tremendous amount, historically, of hemophilia in some of those, in some of the royalty families in, in the Roman Empire and in other empires because of their behavior patterns. So it was really much more common, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is, it was much more common than this in those rural families.
than it was in the general population because of those. I can't imagine wearing your mother. Right. And then there's about there, there's three other hemophilias that are reasonably common. They account for about 15%. So hemophilia B is a uh, defect for factor 9. Hemophilia C is a defect for factor 11. And then hemophilia D, which is the one I pointed out earlier, was a defect for factor 12. And what they do is, when you have a defect in the gene, then the pathway stops. Okay. So you have a pathway of sequential uh, reactions that have to occur. And the defect stops the pathway after defect, so you can't continue the process. And that's why that's why they can't clot their blood, because they all impact being able to get the stabilized fibrin threads. So they can't ever clot their blood. All right. So the other problem with platelets is we can have an abnormal amount of platelets in our blood. So thrombocytopenia would be an abnormally low. Uh, platelet level, where thrombocytosis was a high platelet level. So what's interesting about particularly bloodline cells is that the, the, there's a real pattern to it when we're dealing with bloodline cells. So when we end a word in cytosis, it usually means elevated levels of something. So like erythrocytosis would be an elevated amount of red blood cells, right? And then we end the word in penia to describe a low amount of those cells. So there's a real cool pattern to, to the way we describe too many blood cells or too low of blood cells. So cytosis is elevated blood cell numbers, penia is depressed blood cell numbers, right? And so, what happens with thrombocytopenia is the fact that platelets will drop. If you don't have platelets, you can't clot your blood. So <laughs> it's one of the things that happens with chemotherapy is particularly broad range chemotherapy, particularly managing leukemias themselves, is you destroy all the blood cell producing tissues trying to manage the leukemia. They can't make platelets. So then they will get nosebleeds and they can't stop the nosebleeds. And so then you have to use uh, transfusions for platelet improvement or hormones to drive platelet improvement, depending on the type of chemotherapy you're dealing with. Then what's really fascinating is there are several diseases which are hemorrhagic diseases. So the Ebola was one which was common in Africa. One that's occurring that used to be only in Africa, but has now migrated to uh, to Central America and South America and Southern United States. And it came over on ships with uh, used tires. Uh, and the mosquito that carries it had eggs in the tires, in the water in the tires. And so we, we, we brought the mosquito over that creates dungy fever. And when you get bit by this mosquito, it actually creates a depression in your platelets and they begin to internally bleed and hemorrhage. So so it's called a hemorrhagic fever. So there, there are now known cases of dengue fever that have occurred in, in uh, Arizona, Texas, and Florida. And it never was in, in the United States ever in the past. And really elevated areas now in some areas of Central America, South America. I was actually gonna go birding in Venezuela. I had an opportunity to go. What would have been a really cool trip? And I was really excited. Then I went to CDC. So okay, I'm going to this area of Venezuela. What do I need to be worried about? Dungi fever. Bleed to death while burning. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> so I can go. So, I'm a chicken when it comes to getting diseases that could. <laughs> <laughs> I can look at birds in the picture. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and then the other thing that happens with platelets is they will begin to clot blood abnormally. So a thrombus is an abnormal clot that develops in a blood vessel. So one of our biggest concerns post-operatively, if the operation's been a long operation, is people will develop thrombus in their legs, blood clots in the legs. 
So that's something in managing post-operative pa patient choice I want to be aware of and pay attention to. Uh, because what happens is when you get the patient up and begin to move them around, the clots can break up and circulate in the blood. So these clots that break up are called an embolus. And what happens is they typically go to the brain, the kidney, or the lungs where they kill you. And so that's one of the biggest concerns about having these post-operative root clots. So I actually had an uncle who had a total hip surgery, and uh, they missed the promise. So he was in the hospital two or three days, then they moved him to a rehab center. And in the rehab center, the, the pain specialists come in, the physical therapists. So you wonder what P really stood for. Because <laughs> they're the one that gets you moving, and it hurts to do it at first. They got him up, started moving, and he died of an ambulance because it went through his lungs. Because it came free from his leg, and it was mixed. Is that why when you're in the hospital now, they put those things on your legs? That That's exactly right. You go in the hospital, you're there for a while pretty late. If you've been post-operative or if you're an elderly person, they have these things they put on, they go, and they, they put pressure on your leg. Yeah, yeah they're, they're actually, they actually use an air pump. They fill them up, just like a pressure cuff. Puts pressure on your leg, and then releases it. Puts pressure on your leg, and releases it. Because in normal physiology, what helps us return blood to our heart is muscle contraction. So what the muscles do when the muscles contract is they, they compress blood vessels, veins. And veins have one-way valves in them. So that we can use muscles to help us pump our blood back to our heart. So when you're flat on your back for eight hours in an operation, none of your muscles have been contracting. So blood flow from your extremities is slow. And what happens is when blood doesn't flow and blood begins to cool, it, it tends to initiate the clotting process. So when you, if you've been in an open heart surgery for eight hours, you've been flat on your back for eight hours, there's been no movement in your legs, and there's a good chance that you will have started to develop some clotting in your legs, particularly at the older you get. So I always think about that every time I get my, when my folks were still living in New York, I would fly from Spokane, New York, across the country. Usually the shortest leg of the flight was at least five hours. And you sit in one of those planes where you can't move much, those ridiculous seats for five hours. The older you get, the greater chance you can start developing. Clots in your legs. I actually had a friend that, had, that went on an eight-hour flight. When he got off the flight, his his calf hurt really bad. So he thought, well, that's weird. I'll, I'll have this checked out. Plug clock. Yeah. So now I get up and walk around and plug with my legs. So that I'm not sure of the mechanism, but I can look that So why do we have a heart and we have to pump blood? So if you took all of the blood vessels in the body, put them in the end, we have about 60,000 miles of blood vessels, which is amazing when you think about it. And you have to have a heart that can pump blood through all of that. So on an average day, we pump about 3,600 gallons of blood. And on an average year, your blood pumps about 2.6 million gallons of blood. Now, at any point in time, you have roughly about six liters of blood, or a gallon and a half. So what you're doing is repumping that blood continually uh, through your body. So this stuff we're going to talk about in the lab. So I'm going to kind of skip over this. Uh, and I'm going to talk about just a couple things here real quick. Uh, and then that will lead us into where we need to go. So our heart is a four-chambered heart. So we have two upper chambers, which are called atria. So we have a left and right atrium. Then we have two lower chambers, which are ventricles. So if you look at the vertebrate world, 
and you make the transition, it's related to what we were talking about with hemoglobin and red blood cells and nucleated as you go from aquatic environments to terrestrial environments. Fish have, have a two-chambered heart. Uh, amphibians have a three-chambered heart. Birds and mammals have a four-chambered heart as you move from an aquatic world to a terrestrial world the pumping of blood becomes more critical for oxygenation. So the way it works is the right side of the heart collects blood from the body via two major blood vessels, the superior, inferior, vena cava, and then collects blood from the heart itself via the coronary sinus. And then it pumps all of that blood to your lungs to get oxygenated. So the right side of the heart is collecting deoxygenated blood and pumping deoxygenated so that the vena cava is on a model are blue, the pulmonary artery on a model is blue. So every blood vessel associated with the right side of the heart is blue because the role of the right side of the heart is to collect deoxygenated blood and pump that deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Okay. The left side of the heart collects the blood coming back from the lungs. So the blood vessels that come into the pulmonary, excuse me, the blood vessels that come in to the left atrium are the pulmonary veins from the left and right lungs. And then the role of the left ventricle is to pump blood that's oxygenated all over your body. So every major blood vessel on the left side of the heart is red on the whole because you have oxygenated blood in pulmonary veins and you're pumping blood to the body via the major artery that exits the left side of the heart, the aorta. So when you look at a heart, model, the left and right is separated based upon oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood and the pumping faction of the heart. So because the heart is designed to pump, to pump you have to compress uh, the heart and you use muscles to compress the heart and then you have to relax those muscles so that the heart will expand again in the field. So the heart is continually changing from positive to negative pressures. And because we're creating negative and positive pressures all the time, we have to have one-way valves in the heart, because otherwise the heart would just pump blood up and down in itself based upon these pressures. So we have valves that exist between the atria and the ventricles that are called atrial ventricular valves, or AV valves. And they have a name based upon their structural component. So in the right side, we have a valve called the tricuspid valve, and in the left side, we have a valve called the bicuspid valve. And the valves get their name because of how they're structurally composed. So the tricuspid valve has three parts to it, and the bicuspid valve has two parts to it. Okay. Now, what happens if you look at the heart itself is the myocardium on the right ventricle is thin compared to the myocardium on the left ventricle. And you can really see that in this cross-sectional view, where you look at the myocardium on the left side of the heart, and you look at the myocardium on the right side of the heart. And that's because the right side of the heart is pumping blood from the heart to the lungs, and the lungs are essentially at the same level as the heart. So the amount of pressure required to move the blood is less. So the myocardium isn't as thick. The left side of the heart is pumping blood to the top of your head and to the tip of your toes. So the amount of pressure the left side of the heart has to exert is much greater because the blood is being pumped at a greater distance. So the left side has a much thicker myocardium to create greater force than the right side. And therefore, you can get by with a tricuspid valve on the right side because you have less pressure and a tricuspid valve is a weaker valve. And you have a bicuspid valve on the left side because you have greater pressure and it's a stronger valve. So the valves themselves kind of self-describe where they are if you think in terms of pressure. Right? And then what happens is when the ventricle contracts, it puts pressure on the blood and pushes the blood up into the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. When the ventricles relax, they create a negative pressure, and the tendency would be for the blood to, and the aorta and the pulmonary uh, artery to just drain back into the ventricle. 
And then you'd just be pumping blood up and down in the axis of your heart, and it wouldn't work. So we have to have a second set of valves that are at the base of, of the two major arteries. So we have a valve in the base of our pulmonary trunk. So we call it the pulmonary semilunar valve. Or some people come both pulmonary to pulmonic semilunar valve. And then we have a valve in the base of our aorta called the aortic semilunar. So semilunar valves are in the base of arteries, and they prevent blood from flowing back into the heart. All right. So clinically, when we listen to someone's heart, we just see dis we hear descriptive sounds. Love, duh, love, duh. The love is the closing of the tricuspid and bicuspid valve together, and the duh is the closing of the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves together. So the sounds clinically that we listen to in a heart is created by these valves closing shut and the turbulence of blood, uh, turbulence in blood is created by the valves closing. So the reason why we listen to someone's heart is to find out if the valves are closing tight so if somebody's valves aren't closing tight, we say they have a heart murmur. And what you'll get is blood passing back through the valve. And as the blood passes back through the valve, it vibrates the edge of the valve and creates turbulence. So what you would hear is somebody has a bicuspid or tricuspid valve that's not closing correctly is a hissing sound. So instead of lupto, 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 you hear That's what people are listening to when they listen to your heart. See so that you've got this crisp sound, or whether you've got a hiss sound after it. If it's on the first sound, then we know it's either a tricuspid or bicuspid valve. And that's why they listen to two sides of your heart. Because then they can pick out the sound where the sound is louder. Okay. So the tricuspid and the bicuspid are the ones that, at the base of the arteries that prevent the blood flow back? No, they're between the atrium and ventricles. Semilunar valves are at the base of the arteries. So the second sound, lub dub, is the closing of the two semilunar valves. So if you hear lub dubs, lub dubs, then the hissing is on the second sound, then you know it's either a aortic semilunar valve or a pulmonic semilunar valve. And again, the valves are slightly offset from one another. So if you listen to the left and right side of the heart, then you can actually tell. And actually what we'll do in Tuesday's lab is I have, I, I have a, a, an image that shows where the heart is relative to the ribs. And what people have to learn to do clinically at first until they get accustomed to it is count ribs to know where the fuck the steps go and then actually they can listen to it. But once you've done it a whole bunch of times, then it becomes pretty common. That's why doctors can do it without ever even looking at your chest field anymore, because they've gotten so used to doing it. That's kind of a cool pattern. When you're first learning, you know, count the ribs. <laughs> Same way with EKGs. When you're first learning to put on all the little these fields for EKGs, you have to know how to count all those fields to know where they go. So you can tell somebody who's done EKGs for a long time and somebody who hasn't because they have to have the patient naked so they can count all the ribs. And then the other person can just feel them put them in place, even under a garment. So. so when we're thinking about the valves, because the valves are being closed and opened by pressure, then the valves, the two valves open and close together, but the two sets of valves are open and closed at different times. So when we look at a cardiac cycle, which when you were listening to someone's heart would be one love dub, then during that cardiac cycle where there's love dub, there's going to be two points in time that are very, very short points in time when all valves are closed. There'll be one point in time where the bicuspid and tricuspid valves are open, but the semilunar valves are closed. And there'll be another point in time where the tricuspid and bicuspid valves are 
closed, but the semi-lunar valves are open. Okay? So lub dub. So we said lub was the bicuspid, tricuspid valve. And it was closing, right? So what closes the bicuspid, tricuspid valves is when the ventricle begins to contract. So when the ventricle is contracting, it wants to pump blood into the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, right? So when the ventricle is contracting, the tricuspid and bicuspid valve will be closed and the semilunar valves will be open. So that's after love, the first sound, love, duh. Because love is actually the closing of the AV valves. You can't hear semilunar valves open. <coughs> so the second sound is dub, which is the closing of the semilunar valves. So after dub, we would be in this state, right? Because the semilunar valves are closed. The semilunar valves are closing because the ventricle is relaxing. So as the ventricle relaxes, there's a negative pressure in the ventricle. <coughs> that causes the closing of the semilunar valves with the opening of the AV valves. So in the time frame between love dub, the heart is in this state. The time frame between dub and the next love, the heart is in this state. They're all closed at the exact sound of love and the exact sound of the. Okay? <coughs> For only a fraction of a second. Okay? And it's all negative pressure. Uh, it's all based upon negative positive pressure that opens it. And uh, we'll refine that in a little bit. Okay? All right. So this stuff I'm covering in my own. So, <coughs> what makes your heart tick, so to speak, is the fact that it has its own inherent pacemaking system. So, <coughs> what's cool is your heart doesn't need your brain. Your heart needs your brain to make your heart accelerate when you're exercising and slow down when you're not exercising. Independent of that, your, your heart doesn't need to break. Your heart would just have a normal, steady rate. So I used to demonstrate this in class when we had an animal room, and it wasn't as politically incorrect to kill animals. And I used to take a frog before class and put the frog under and cut its heart out, put it in a beaker. And the frog heart would say, beat in the beaker. And as long as I changed the fluid in the beaker periodically, so that it was oxygenated and stuff, I could leave that, I could get that frog heart to stay beating in that beaker for six hours of that. So your heart doesn't need your brain to beat because it has its own inherent pacemaker system. So what they have to do when they do transplants, when they're transporting the heart from one area to the recipient, so they actually have to ice the heart down to slow it down because it's... B, the whole time it's in transport. All right. So what initiates a cardiac cycle is a uh, electrical excited, excitatory group of cells that is at the upper part of the right atrium where the, where the superior vena cava enters the right atrium. So it's called the sinoatrial node. So atrial because it's in the atrium. Sino is a reference to the embryonic development of the heart where the two vena cavas were joined at one time when the atrium was forming. So the sinoatrial node is the one that initiates a cardiac cycle or a love dug that you would listen to. And then the heart works just like skeletal muscle in that we have a depolarization followed by a Repolarization. And depolarization causes skeletal muscles to contract or relax. Contract. 
and repolarization cause skeletal muscles to relax. Same thing is going to be true of the heart. A depolarization is going to cause the myocardium of the heart to contract, and a repolarization is going to cause the myocardium of the heart to relax. So to create a pumping action of the heart, we want to cause the atria to contract and then relax. And we want to be able to cause the ventricles to contract and relax. So the sinoatrial node causes a depolarization of the atria, which is going to cause the atria to contract. When the atria contract, they put pressure on blood to move into the ventricle. So the atria force fill the ventricle, okay? And then what happens is there's a secondary node at the top of the interventricular septum, which is what separates the left and right ventricle internally, in the floor of the right atrium, which is called the atrioventricular node because it's kind of at the boundary of the atrium and the ventricles, or AV node. What eventually happens is the depolarization from the SA node comes to, eventually travels to the AV node, and then it causes the AV node to create a rapid depolarization. And then because the ventricles are enormous co compared to the atria, then the ventricles have to have a conducting system where the atria didn't, because the atria are small and the myocardium is thin. So you can just you can just move it across the myocardium itself. But because the ventricles are enormous in size and thick, we actually have to have conducting fibers to help us carry it. So what happens is there's a single fiber that goes from the AV node to the top of the interventricular septum. So it's called the atrioventricular bundle, or the bundle of his. And HIS isn't a a reference to gender in this instance. It's actually this, a Swedish last name. So it was a Swedish uh, cardiologist that actually figured this out. And then what happens is the bundle of his branches, and you get one on the left side and one on the right side, so they're called the left and right branch fibers, or bundles. And then what happens is we have little fibers that come off these big branches, and the little fibers that come off the little branches are called Purkinje. So what happens is we, we depolarize the AV node. That depolarization is carried down the bundle of his. The depolarization then is carried down the branch fibers to the Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers transfer it to the myocardium. And so that would make the ventricles contract. And so the way the heart works is the, the top of the heart contracts first. And then the bottom of the heart contracts second. And while the bottom of the heart is contracting, the top of the heart is relaxing. So the atria went through a depolarization and a repolarization. And then the ventricle goes through a depolarization and a repolarization. So we have two nodes so that we can accomplish a different time frame for the activity of the top of the heart compared to the time frame for the bottom of the heart. Does that make sense? Because you want the atria to contract and fill the ventricles. And then you want the ventricles to contract and pump the blood. Okay? So obviously, this electrical system is critically important to your survival. And without it, you aren't going to survive. So in lab, I have some, um, I have some pacemakers kind of going from early pacemakers to more current pacemakers for you to look at. So if somebody's SA node doesn't work, then their heart will become irregular. And the way we make the heart be irregular again is to put a pacemaker. So if somebody becomes arrhythmic, meaning they pull, they have a, a change in, in heart rate, and then it becomes problematic, because a lot of people, you take their pulse, they, they have irregular heart rates anyway. <laughs> but when it becomes symptomatic, then we, then we correct it with a pacemaker. So, so yesterday, there's one of the cadavers is an elderly woman. And so I want you guys to be able to see some of the organs we've been talking about. So yesterday afternoon, I opened her thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity. So tomorrow, one thing we're going to do is go in and look at the cadavers and 
look at the internal organs that we've been talking about. But one of the coolest things was I was I was palpating your, your clavicle so I could figure out where I wanted to cut, and then I felt something weird right here. She had a patient with it. You know, it was under her skin right here by her clavicle, and you can see the wires dropping into mm -hmm. her thoracic cavity. So I left it in place. I just cut around it so I could leave the pacemaker in place so you could see it. So it was really kind of cool to see this. So, so that's one of the things we're going to do in the lab tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to try something different with you guys. Everyone's fucking bored with what I'm doing. We're, we're going we're gonna to start with an EKG and then go back to that. So clinically, you could if you want. Wouldn't be helpful to me. It could be. We do an EKG because we want to know what is going on electrically with the heart. And then, if we know what's going on electrically with the heart, then we can we can infer what's going on mechanically with the heart at certain points. So when you do an EKG, you can make an EKG look a number of different ways depending on the needs. So. So essentially, we get a series of waves that all look like this. Okay. And so if we wanted to define a cardiac cycle, then we would define a cardiac cycle as being from the start of one P wave to the next P wave. So this would be one cardiac cycle. And during that one cycle, if you were listening to someone's heart, you would hear one, love, so. Okay. If you were taking someone's pulse during that cardiac cycle, you would feel one pulse. Okay. So tying the way we try to figure out clinically what's going on with someone's heart, we take a pulse, we listen to their heart, we do an EKG. <laughs> They're all inherently linked to one. This is like one cycle. That uh, is one cycle. Right. So what we do is we name the waves. So this wave is a P wave. This is a complex wave that has three subparts to it. So Q, R, and S. And then this wave is a T wave. And then we would just repeat it again, P, Q, R, S, T. Now, what, what they do clinically is they use 12 leads. So they put 12 little patches on you around your heart. And you can make this wave pattern look different depending on how the machine is interpreting the leads. So that's why in a clinical setting, there are 12 usually graphs simultaneously being done. And the graphs are all different based upon how the leads are being interpreted by the machine. So only one of those graphs will look like this, because that's an interpretation based upon how the leads are coming in being read. Does that make sense? So what we're actually doing is measuring depolarizations and repolarizations of the heart from the surface of the skin. All right. So an EKG is measuring electrical activity in the heart from the surface of the skin. So if you're not really quiet while you're doing an EKG, then you get into muscle contractions, skeletal muscle contractions, that make all these crazy waves because you're measuring then depolarization and repolarization of Skeletal muscles, all right? So you get so depending on what the patient's doing, you get our artifacts from that. All right. So we can divide the heart into the upper part of the heart, which are the two atria, 
and the bottom of the part of the heart, which are the two ventricles. And what we just said was, because the SA node is at the top of the heart, the atria are active first, and the ventricles are active second. So that would mean that the first part of this EKG has something to do with atria. And the second part of this EKG has something to do with ventricle. Okay? So that's why we have multiple waves, because we have two parts of the heart that are active. Right? So now, the other thing that you have to understand is that a wave, and I don't care whether we're talking about the P wave, whether we're talking about QRS as a sequence, or whether we're talking about a T wave, T wave. A wave is a change in membrane retention. Okay. Can you please change that R to P? trouble teaching. I'm like two sentences, my main's always two sentences ahead of my mouth. You know what I mean? Because I don't use any notes. So talk about <coughs> All right. So a change in membrane tension. So is a depolarization a change in membrane potential? Yes. Is a repolarization a change in membrane? So then we could say P, Q, R, S are either depolarization events or repolarization events. So then that means that a flat line is membrane potential. Basis of any KG. Flat lines, membrane potential is staying steady. A wave membrane potential is changing. Okay. So now I'll just go back to this one. So notice that where we're going to start right here is approximately minus 90. So, where I start this EKG, my membrane potential is not changing, and it's staying at approximately 90 millivolts. But because it's staying at minus 90, there's no change, right? Now, from 90, what, where is a depolarization going to carry the in terms of membrane potential? So, so when we're talking about muscles, we actually start at minus seven and still ninety because the heart's a little bit. But where did we go from minus seven for threshold? Right. So we had to move the membrane for fifty-five to fifty-five, and then what happened once we reached threshold? We went to plus thirty. So what we did, we actually changed the membrane from a negative number to a plus number. And when we were doing skeletal muscle, it was minus seventy to a plus 30. And we had this target we had to reach, which was minus 55, right? Which we said was pressure. <coughs> so an SA node has to create a threshold event to make the heart work, right? All right. So cardiac
cardiac physiology is just a little different. Uh, so notice that we're going to peak out at plus 20 on this graph. So where skeletal muscle, the numbers were a little different. Uh, and cardiac muscle is the same principle, but the membrane potentials are different. And that helps us separate <laughs> some activity in our body. Okay? What's the threshold? Yeah, it's, a, it's approximately a, a 15 millivolt short term for potential. It varies in people. But yeah, if you have somebody who's, whose SA node is, is not working at all, then what you have to do is trigger about a 15 millivolt change to get the depolarization process to start. So depolarization is connected to what channels? What do we have to open to create a depolarization? Sodium channel. So we have sodium that's going to move in for a depolarization. And what ion was responsible for depolarization? Potassium. So we have potassium channels. So that didn't change. That's the good news. Depolarization is still going to be strong. It's going to be created by an opening of voltage gated sodium channels. And repolarization is going to be created by an opening of voltage-gated potassium channels. The key to remember is they're voltage-gated. So the key to the threshold was you change the voltage, you can open the channel. Right? So, so that's the whole thing that we need to do. So the SA node needs to create a shift in voltage so that we can open sodium channels. Once we open sodium channels, then we're committed to go through a process we call depolarization. Okay. And in, in, in skeletal muscle physiology, what we talked about was as soon as the membrane hit plus 30, sodium channels closed and potassium channels open. So what we had was voltage-gated channels that were open and closing based upon the shifts in voltage. Cardiac muscle is different there. So one of the things we demonstrated uh, using electricity on skeletal muscle was the fact that with skeletal muscle, I could create depolarization events so rapidly that I could create a muscle contraction we call tetany, where the muscle stayed contracted for a long period of time. Would you want your heart to be able to undergo tetany? No, you actually want your heart to have to go through a depolarization and repolarization before it can do another depolarization. Because you don't want to cramp in your heart. You can only occur once in your life. And then that would be it, right? So, what we have to do is we have to figure out how to disconnect this depolarization and repolarization from being as rapid of an event so that we can elongate the depolarization event. So that's what's unique to cardiac muscle. So if we go back to this graph, and what I want you to pay attention to right now is this graph. And what I want to do is I want to relate this graph to these events. So here's my depolarization and repolarization. Notice that the initial part of my depolarization, the ion that's moving most rapidly is sodium. That's what we said would create a depolarizing event. Notice when I go to repolarization, the ion that's moving is this one, which is potassium. So this is a graph of membrane permeability. So when the membrane is, is highly permeable, then the ion moves quickly and you get a peak all right, uh, of ion movement. But in cardiac physiology, what we want to do is we want to disconnect this peak of depolarization from the initiation of repolarization. And the way we do it is we have a second channel that's involved in depolarization, which is a calcium channel. So what you see in cardiac physiology is the fact that depolarization is really elongated 
the first part of depolarization is caused by sodium. The second part of depolarization is caused by calcium. So that this is caused by sodium, this is caused by calcium. Right? So without longer lines going up the top, it's pretty much the No, I'm not I'm not talking about this one. No, the bottom. This one? No. This that one. one. This one is this one. And I don't want to talk about that. So what I want you to do is look at this. This is depolarization. And understand that sodium is the first part of depolarization. Calcium is a continuation of depolarization. And then we have repolarization here. So it's skeletal muscle. We quickly move the membrane plus 30 allowed it to repolarize. Here we're moving calcium. So we've disconnected the sodium and the calcium in this depolarization, repolarization frame. And what happens is the, the calcium moves slowly. So even though the membrane stays depolarized, the membrane isn't changing its electrical potential. So what we end up with is a flat stud. So we end up with rapid depolarization, a plateau, and then repolarization. Okay. Now, what we said here was a flat line means no change. A plateau represents no change. So part of my flat lines on my EKG are actually going to do, be due to slow depolarization by calcium. So even though the membrane is depolarized, it's not changing electric potential. Because what an EKG measures is change in electric potential on the membrane. Okay? And I'll leave you at that thought to ponder. I wish I could go on.